Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest, Daniela Fernandez. Daniela, thank you so much for joining thank you for me. Having me, Aaron. My pleasure. You are the founder and CEO of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. That's right. Tell me what the alliance is and what your goals are. Absolutely. So, Sustainable Ocean Alliance is a global organization that aims to empower young people everywhere to help create ocean solutions. And what that means, it could be anything from planting coral reefs, raising awareness about plastic, or creating ocean technology startups. So uh, you mentioned uh, reefs. We had uh, Jeff Orlovsky on, who did Chasing Coral. He's a good friend. I, see, I assume you have, have seen that. You know, that visually was so shocking. Uh, you would think that anyone seeing that would have an immediate concern. What, what's your sense, I mean, given the, obviously the size of the oceans that you know water covers over two-thirds of the planet it doesn't seem like a lot of people are concerned about the health of the oceans as they should be I think many people think just due to the size of the oceans that whatever problems whatever challenge uh, that that they're faced with as it were they can handle talk a little bit about that absolutely people simply don't grasp what's going on in the ocean and it's one of those problems of out of sight out of mind if you're not living in the coastal area you don't spend time in the ocean if you're not scuba diving you don't see the damage that is going on and so even in elementary school you're taught that our oxygen comes from trees and you're not taught that oxygen actually 50 percent of oxygen comes from the ocean so every second breath you take is literally supplied by our ocean. And that's just not public knowledge. And it's something that we definitely have to just get more people to wrap their mind around and understand. So uh, in that vein, in, in terms of the critical importance of the oceans as really our primary supplier of oxygen, of fresh oxygen uh, for the whole planet, what is happening that's endangering that supply that may bring it home to people individually, not just about their care for nature, but their care for themselves, their children, their grandchildren. Yeah, so one of the main concerns is our carbon supply. So the oxygen act, sorry, the ocean actually is a carbon sink for us. It uh, takes in about 48% of the carbon in the atmosphere. So as the ocean gets warmer and gets more acidic, then we have change in our coral reef structures, for example. And then that's where we're seeing so many of our reefs being destroyed. In addition to that, we have um, lotions such as sunscreen that have really, really dangerous chemicals for coral reefs and they're decaying them. So when you think about all of the impact that we're having as humans is both from our carbon footprint, but also from what we're putting into the ocean, from chemicals to also plastic products. I mean, plastic we can talk about as well. That is one of the, the most horrendous things that's going on right now. By the year 2050, we're going to have more plastic than fish in the ocean. And that's something that humans are directly contributing to. So I do want to talk about plastic, but going back first to uh, what the oceans are doing for us as a buffer for climate change. And, and what I don't think a lot of people realize is how much heat is being absorbed by the oceans when people say, well, why haven't we seen you know, more of the effects of climate change? What they don't realize is that the oceans are doing our dirty work for us. Exactly. But there's a limit to what they can do. So talk about, if, if you would, the impacts of the extraordinary amount of heat oceans already have absorbed and what's going to happen if that continues. Absolutely. So you have phytoplankton and you have seaweed that absorb all the all the carbon from the from the atmosphere. And once they reach a limit and they start dying off, the ocean will no longer be able to serve as a carbon suction. And that's when all the carbon will be stuck in our atmosphere and the, and the planet will get warmer. So we're at a point where if we don't protect the ocean and don't protect the species, the ecosystems living inside of it, we're doomed. I mean, that's frankly what it is. And when you think about half of the oxygen comes from the ocean, but also half the carbon is absorbed by it. And so that's something that we have to be really careful about and making sure that we have a pH level that is actually sustainable in our ocean, that it's not too acidic, that it's not too um, carbon filled, because otherwise, like you said, you know, if we don't take care of it, we're going to get to a point where the ocean is no longer going to be able to supply that balance. I think that a lot of people either are just totally unaware of what's going on in the oceans, or even if they are, to some extent, their assumption is because of the size, depth of the oceans, that, oh, they can continue to do this indefinitely. Talk a little bit about what, what is happening with the acidification 
uh, of oceans and how it's already having an impact on life in the oceans. Yeah, we're reaching a tipping point here. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change re recently said that we have about 10 years to curb our emissions. And when you look at the ocean space, we have species dying. About 40% of marine bio biodiversity is already gone, right? When you think about that grasp of everything from our phytoplankton, all of the nutrients that we have in the ocean, it's being depleted. And we're not seeing it because, you know, like I said earlier, it's out of sight and out of mind. And when you talk to scientists, they're seeing the changes that are going on in the ocean space. So we honestly have a very limit, limited amount of time to make that change happen before we don't have any more coral reefs, we don't have any more mammals that are in the ocean. All of our ecosystems pretty much fail. And when you think about the amount of people that depend on the ocean also as a living source, 3.5 billion people depend on fish as a primary source of protein. And it certainly in certain parts already of the world, uh, stocks have already been significantly depleted. Uh, even in the United States, if anyone's paying attention, if you look at the cost of fish, of almost any kind of fish, including farm fish, everything has gone up significantly in the last decade. Yeah, you see the costs rising as well. And then you also see fishermen who their entire livelihood was fishing. They have to start looking for a new alternative. And it's been interesting that there's been a huge paradigm shift around fishing and protecting marine life and creating marine protected sanctuaries, whereas fishermen can now you know, keep, keep off the, the fish in the ocean and get tourists, ecotourism as a new source of income. But that's definitely a big concern that we have. Yeah, in fact, in some areas, uh, certain uh, fishing for, for certain fish, uh, certain life is actually being suspended or banned. Uh, because the uh, simply the populations have been so severely depleted. Definitely, the Palau government, for example, is an amazing is an amazing case study. When you look at it, the government's completely banned fishing from their exclusive economic zone, and so when you look at that, they're investing in their generations to come. They're investing in the fact that young people, their grandchildren, will have fish to see and to meet and to experience in their own lifetime. Um, the Indonesian government as well, uh, Minister Suzy also, who's a, who's a great friend, she's been blowing up ships <laughs> who uh, are fishing illegally, right? And so when you look at the drastic measures we have to take, and it's also a matter of help, help, helping people understand what the repercussions are to us fishing and the rate that we're doing right now. Now, I, I don't think a lot of people um, identify with plankton, for example. Yeah. Uh, well, unless you watch SpongeBob. <laughs> what but, was that guy's name called? <laughs> don't ask me. I've already forgotten. Uh, but it's a great show. Um, but how about uh, shellfish and, and what's happening and with the acidifi uh, acidification? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, shellfish are also being completely destroyed, right? When you look at the, the acidity, lev acidity levels that are happening in the ocean, uh, they're losing their homes, they're losing their, their, uh, their, their, their skeletons. And so we're trying to figure out how can we make sure that we have a pH level that is sustainable for them to be in. Um, and you also think about all of the different mechanisms that happen once one, one species is gone, then the entire ecosystem, the food chain, collapses, right? If you don't have phytoplankton, you lose, you know, a lot of other animals that are um, dependent on it for, for its food source. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We will be back with Daniela in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rexal Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political, and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. 
Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Daniela Fernandez. So uh, tell me more about the Alliance and, and kind of the, the history and, and how things happen. I know you had some very exciting, uh, actually, uh, events that were preceded by some scary times, too. <laughs> Oh, so like any entrepreneur, right, there's ups and downs every hour of the day. So I'll tell you a little bit of the background of how this whole thing started. I was a freshman in college. I went to Georgetown University, and I was very passionate about climate change. I majored in economics and government because back then my theory of change was if we can change policy in the climate space, we can impact a lot of people and support the, the sphere. But then when I started getting into the political landscape, I soon realized that it wasn't the most effective way. <laughs> so I had the opportunity to attend a meeting at the UN when I was 19 years old. And this meeting was on the state of the ocean. The government that was hosting it was the government of Palau. And so as you can imagine, a 19-year-old, you know, being at, at the UN and, you know, those, those round tables surrounded by heads of state being, you know, alongside ambassadors and CEOs and feeling totally out of place. But at the same time, I was learning so much about our ocean. I was learning about the statistics that I shared with you earlier about, you know, plastic will be all over our ocean, about the decline of, uh, of our fisheries. And so I, I had this moment at the UN where I, fe I felt completely terrified what was going on in our ocean. And I also felt as if my generation did not understand what was going on, and those conversations were taking place behind closed doors. And so my big takeaways leaving that room was one of them, young people are not part of the conversation, and two, everyone in the room was talking about the problem, but no one was talking about the solutions. There was no hope, there was no future to it. And so I left there just feeling completely overwhelmed, terrified, and just frustrated at the system, feeling as if I had to do something to, to make a change there. So what did you do next? You're still in school. I'm still in school. It's my freshman year. So as you can imagine, I have a lot of other things to worry about. But I was on the train ride from the UN back to Georgetown. And I kid you not, I, I was sketching out what this alliance could be, what this platform could be, and I, I, I drew two circles. One circle was young people, the other circle was global leaders, and then I said, I need to unite these two groups because there's power in helping young people understand what's happening to the ocean, but there's also power in having world leaders understand the ideas that young people may have, the innovative thinking, different perceptions that they may have and how they can, you know, solve these problems. And so that's when Sustainable Ocean Alliance was born in this idea of how can I bring these two worlds together to talk to one another, to learn from one another, to impact change. All right, so you were in the center of political power in the country, if not the world, Washington, D.C. Uh, you've then been graduated from school and you leave. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. Most people would have done the opposite. But... <laughs> yeah, I. so my natural progression should have been to go to Wall Street, right? I had my background was in economics and I did a lot of finance internships. And I found myself upon graduation, I walked across that stage, having turned down all my job offers, having no funding for my nonprofit whatsoever, and simply having this gut feeling and responsibility of having to continue the work I started. Because at this point, there were a lot of young people globally depending on me and looking at me for answers and for support. So I couldn't let the Alliance you know, just be a side project and go get a job, <laughs> like most people would do. But rather, I, I felt as if I had to continue building this organization, and I knew I, I could take it to the next level. I just didn't know how. And so what did you do? You moved to San Francisco. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I yeah. moved. Go ahead. No, well, that's a surprise to me. Tell me why and then what happened. Yeah, so I moved to San Francisco because I wanted to capture the energy of Silicon Valley. I, I saw a lot of potential in using innovation and entrepreneurship and capital and investment and, and take that package and take it to the ocean space. Because in D.C., I saw a lot of people talking about policy change and about how we can move the needle with policy, and I just wasn't convinced anymore that that was the, the right answer, or at least part of the equation, right? Um, and so I, I realized that Silicon Valley, you know, has created Google's and Facebook, and why not create the next big tech company? Um, or why not use tech for the sake of the ocean? So that's why I moved to Silicon Valley. 
All right, and at one point you were literally down to your last dollar. What happened? Yeah, so I moved there not knowing anyone. Um, I had a couple of angel donors, you know, who gave me enough money to to help me, you know, live in San Francisco for a year until I found more donations. And I had one full-time volunteer, um, a gentleman uh, who had quit his job and was working with me full-time to grow out this accelerator program, which I can tell you more about. And it was about I, I, weeks out where we had more money left. And I didn't have any personal savings at all. You know, I, I only had what I, was, what I had raised. And so I, I heard about this amazing uh, pineapple fund. And it was this cryptocurrency uh, millionaire who had to, uh, decided to donate $80 million to nonprofits. Everyone thought it was insane. Everyone thought it was a hoax. But of course, <laughs> I'm desperate at this point, and I believe in cryptocurrency. And so I email him, and they say to him, my subject line was uh, using technology to save the ocean. And I you know, write him a, a long email explaining to him my theory of change, my, um, my passion, my mission for the organization. And I kid you not, the next day I get an email back saying, Dear Daniela, here's a million dollars for your organization. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the most successful fundraising stories for a nonprofit <laughs> I've ever heard. So tell me, who else is involved in the Alliance? So part of the Alliance, first of all, the core of our group is our young people. We have young people in over 135 countries that are doing work on the ground. Uh, we have an amazing group of mentors, um, from the scientists to policymakers to business people uh, that are there to support our young people, right? If a young person has an idea, they you know, come to our, our young people, um, they, go, they go to our experts for support. Um, we also have business leaders in the space um, that are willing to support ocean innovation. So they also provide mentorship and resources to our entrepreneurs. And then we also have policymakers um, who are, like Secretary John Kerry, who are mentors for advisors and who uh, open the doors for our young people to be part of these higher level conversations. All right, really uh, very, very impressive. So we're going to take our last break. We will be back with Daniela to wrap up in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Safely stop fires around your home. Introducing the Fire Ice XT 20 ounce aerosol canister. Fire Ice XT is an eco-friendly water-based fire suppressant gel. Unlike a traditional fire extinguisher, Fire Ice XT is a highly effective, non-toxic firefighting agent that is easy and safe to use around your home, family, and pets. Available at Amazon.com or call 800-924-4874. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at HarborTV.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our final segment with Daniela Fernandez. So we had briefly touched on plastic and, and the volume of plastic in the ocean is extraordinary. Talk about what the challenge is, what the problem is, uh, especially at the micro level, because I think people always think, oh, there's a uh, plastic bottle floating. Uh, but that's not necessarily the biggest problem. Yeah, absolutely. So we have two main problems. The first problem is we have so much plastic that's already in the ocean, right? Um, there's a statistic that I think will resonate with a lot of people is that every minute, imagine a truckload of plastic being dumped into the ocean. And that's happening right now as we speak. And so we have these enormous garbage patches all over the world at this point, and we have to figure out to clean up that, that mess. And then the other component of it is we are still developing and creating plastic. That has not stopped. And so when we think about the plastic bottle that you're referring to, then we have also microplastics that are being broken down and entering our food supply because fish end up eating these microplastics, which are now being found in bloodstreams of human beings. 
So when you think about the, the problems, it's not just an environmental problem, it's truly a health concern as well. So what, uh, when you look at the volume of plastic in the oceans, are, what kind of solutions are, are out there? Number one, for the, you, you mentioned the, the giant plastic garbage patches. Uh, and really, what can we do about the microplastics? Because those are distributed uh, throughout all the oceans now. Yeah, unfortunately there hasn't been a solution for microplastics quite yet. There's a lot of beach cleanups happening. There's the, uh, the ocean cleanup, which is uh, you know, uh, this entrepreneur that decided to build a big machine to clean up all the ocean, which is being, being launched and it's successful. Um, but now it's a matter to figure out what other technology can we enlist and how can we use nets for catching plastic instead of just catching fish, right? There's a lot of potential there. But one of the things that I'm most excited about are innovations to replace plastic. One of our companies uh, it's called Lollywear, and what they're doing is they're creating um, plastic straws or straws out of seaweed as opposed to plastic. So when you have this company that is creating straws out of seaweed instead of plastic, these straws biodegrade in water in 18 hours as opposed to plastic that lasts a lifetime. We're seeing other companies that are using avocado seeds, that are using all these other biodegradable materials to develop um, films and cans and, and um, those, those circles that are used for, um, for beer bottles, right? So there's definitely innovation going on. Now the question is how can we scale that and how can we make sure that we have these new materials accessible to all the populations? What could we do both in the United States uh, but globally to implement a serious plastic recycling effort because uh, one of the challenges now is that you know, most people throw out uh, their plastic containers uh, once they're used or if they're from the grocery store or whatever the case may be. Um, the, r really, when you look at the recycling industry in great part, it's, it has collapsed financially. Uh, and so now uh, people are, actually people who were recycling uh, are not recycling, or they may think they're recycling, but their recycling is going to landfills again. What, what can we do, and why have, given the seriousness of this, why hasn't there been a, a real effort to recycle plastic on a huge scale? We need to tackle the infrastructure of the recycling system, and, and that's the biggest challenge, right? Because it's not a national platform, rather it's by district and by region. So as an individual, you can go and contact your, you know, your district politician and, and figure out what are you doing, how can you help us figure out the system, um, or we can elevate it to a national stage. And I would love to see a presidential candidate at this point, right, talking about, uh, like you said, a nationwide recycling program that simply does not exist. Um, I would also say that people can vote with their dollars. So encourage businesses to change their packaging, right? To biodegradable or compostable materials because a lot of businesses are now feeling the pressure of having to change because public are saying, I'm willing to pay more money to use this material that it will not harm our planet, but rather support it. Should we have a deposit on plastic? Uh, for example, if, if you have a milk carton and there's a, a 10 or 20 cent deposit, it creates a financial incentive for people to put their plastics together and then recycle them. Absolutely, or going back to the old days of having, uh, what was it? Uh, milk and bottles. Exactly, yeah. milk and bottles, why not, right? Or you think about the, the old days when we also had paper bags and paper everything. Um, so I think it's also, like you said, it's a financial incentive, um, but it's also a moral incentive, right? How can we have people in general understand that them not recycling or them not pushing for alternatives is going to hurt, hurt them at the end of the day. I think one of the really interesting aspects is when you're dumping things in an ocean hundreds, in many cases, thousands of miles away, you don't have the same sense of immediacy. You may be in a community, though, where the landfill is getting filled up, and so that community then may have an incentive uh, to, to really put pressure on people to recycle. Uh, but I, it just seems because people don't think about the oceans that much, it's really hard uh, to, to get them to do anything even in their own daily lives. Definitely. I think it goes back to just having legislation, right? Or having districts have a complete restructuring of their infrastructure, so a system for recycling. Um, when you look at the entire uh, w the world ecosystem of, of garbage dumping, our, our main source of plastic comes from 10 different rivers. 
And so if we can stop those rivers from the intake of plastic, I think we can you know, make a lot of progress in our prevention efforts. But again, in those countries, eight of those rivers are in, um, in China, and then two of those rivers are in Africa. So when you look at the infrastructure that exists, there, there is no infrastructure, right? So really doing targeting efforts in those areas will be key to supporting this. Have you spoken in China? I have not yet. All right. Well, maybe it's time to go. I think so. I think I have to make some plans. <laughs> All right. Now, as you branch out and get other people involved, one of the things that you offer is a leadership course, uh, or the Alliance does, or some instruction. Tell me, tell me how you get other people involved and, and help them gain the skills to be effective. Yeah. So our theory is every young person out there believes in climate change. Everyone believes that they can do something about it. Um, but they don't necessarily have the platform or the toolkit they need to do something tangible. So we provide everything from public speaking efforts uh, to how to fundraise, how to build a business plan, very tangible skill sets that you don't learn. For example, I was never taught how to be a CEO. I was never taught how to start my own organization. I had to learn as I, as I went. And so now I'm packaging my own experience and providing that for young people so that they can go on and, and take ownership of this problem. Instead of pointing the finger at corporations or at institutions that are harming our planet, they can say, I have a responsibility, and now I as an individual will do something about it in my own community. Well, you can learn anything on YouTube these days. So, uh, But no, that's, that's great that you're doing that. Uh, on the corporate side, what kind of response have you gotten? What kind of corporations and what are some of the specific corporations that have had said, we really need to address this and we'd like to help you or at least be involved? Definitely. So we recently launched a corporate partnership with Bank of the West, and it's been a fascinating journey with them because they not only are supporting us as an organization, but they're also divesting from um, any any and the other uh, clients that are doing harm to the ocean. And so we're seeing that level of, you know, putting their, their money where their mouth is, right, and actually doing the things that are important for their clients and for the environment. Um, and with them, we launched uh, the SOA Ocean Leadership Council for corporations to give them a place where they can come together, learn about best practices, learn about how to make their supply chain more efficient, and also learn about innovations in the space, right? If we can help you know, the, the Coca-Colas of the world uh, change the materials that they have through our entrepreneurs, I think that's when success happens. When you bring these problems and you match them with innovation, we're seeing a lot of corporations turn, turning to us now and saying, what can we do and how can we get there faster? All right, last question, looking ahead. Uh, what, what would you really like to, to do with the Alliance? What are some of your goals? And, and what, what is the change that you would like to see happen? Yeah, I would like to see the scale. I think that there's a lot of need globally. Uh, young people all over the world you know, have this passion, have this need. They want to do something. They want to act. Um, we're currently in 135 countries. I want to be in every coastal city globally. Um, I want to have innovation hubs globally to have you know, young people have a, a physical place where they can walk in, you know, do lab work, um, meet mentors, meet, meet their peers. Um, and I also want to make sure that we give young people a seat at the table whether it is at the UN or in different corporate advisory councils, making sure that they have a voice, right? They can actually, um, you know, turn their ideas and make them magic. And when you look at the fourth industrial revolution, right, where we have blockchain, we have AI, we have sensors, we have so much innovation at our disposal. I would love to see a place where, you know, our commitment is to accelerate 100 ocean tech companies in the next three years. So how can we get there faster and how can we drive this entrepreneurial mindset into so many more people globally? All right, great goals. Daniela, thank you thank so you much. I appreciate it. All right, that was Daniela Fernandez. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching. Thank you.